Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher, and I'm founder of Simply Plain Based, where I've got a lot of programs to help you to change your health destiny and change through living a plant-based life. So tonight, I'm with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's the founder of the Barnard Medical Center and author of, I don't know, what are you up to, like 10,000 books now? I mean, something <laughs> like that? I don't know. But tonight, we're talking about your latest book, which I think is your best. I, I really do. And it is the your body in balance, and it's all about homeostasis and about getting your body into shape and balance. So tonight we're talking about we've we've been doing the women's now we're switching over to the men's. So we're going to be talking about tackling hormonal cancer for men and curing erectile dysfunction. That's going to be a good one. So cancer, truly a feared word. I mean, that's one, that phone call, that's going to change your lifestyle. So let's start with the basics. What, what is cancer? Cancer is an unfortunately common condition in which one cell in the body has somehow changed. Normally, cells will reproduce at, in an orderly way. But in cancer, the DNA inside the cell is, is altered so that the cell starts replicating out of control. And it becomes two cells, and then four, and then eight, and 16, and 32, and 64, and it, grow, it becomes this growing mass. And eventually, it can start invading into nearby tissues, and sometimes a piece of it will break off and go somewhere else in the body. So common forms of cancer, for example, colorectal cancer, a cell uh, might get into the bloodstream and go up to the liver, or a breast cell that becomes cancerous might break off and end up in the bones. So that's where we are. That's the, the scary news about it. The good news about it is that we have for many decades been tracking down the causes of it. If you don't smoke, you're much less likely to get lung cancer. And if you eat in uh, healthy ways, there are many, many other cancers that are at more than arm's length. Well, in your book, you talk about Tony, who was a physician. He was president of the hospital. And it, wow, he got cancer, obviously. To share this story. I thought it was so profound. I want to show you, actually, this is a book. This is recalled by life. This was a book that Tony wrote. And I want to tell you about him. His name is, he's a real guy. His name is Tony Sadalero. And he wrote Recalled by Life. This was published in 1982. And this really, it, it made him a celebrity, but it, it also caused doctors to think about cancer in a, in a very different way. What happened was, as you said, he, he was living in Philadelphia. He worked at Methodist Hospital. He was president of the hospital, and he was a busy guy. They were building a new wing and all this kind of stuff. And so anyhow, one day he had an employee physical, and he's, afterwards he's back up in, his, in, his, in the executive suite. The phone rings, and it's the radiologist who just took his annual chest x-ray. He said, Tony, uh, I want you to come back downstairs to radiology. I want you to look at the chest x-ray. There's something I don't like here. So Tony's thinking, okay, what is this? He runs downstairs and the radiologist, who was a friend, puts his x-ray up on the screen and they look at it and there were densities, opacities, things that were not normal in the x-ray. And to every doctor, they start knowing what this could be. To make a long story short, what those densities were was cancer cells that had started somewhere in his body and had spread, and he now had opacities in his sternum, in his ribs, in his skull. And before too long, they were able to figure out the source of it. The source was his prostate gland. Now the prostate is in, the, in a man's abdomen. The bladder sits on top, and then right under it is the prostate that wraps around the urethra that comes out. And a lot of men, get prostate cancer, they get cancerous cells. But for almost all of them, or most of them, those cells just kind of sit there and they, they don't grow very fast. One might become two, and two becomes four, but it's just really, really, really slow. But Tony was 45 years old. The cancer had already spread throughout his body, meaning he had an extremely aggressive form of the disease. And this was a death sentence. So that was it. His oncologist said, get your affairs in order. Uh, his lifespan would be measured in a matter of a few months. Uh, and to make all this worse, Tony's own father had cancer at the time. His father had lung cancer. And in fact, his father died very sh shortly after this. 
So Tony went up to New Jersey where his mother was and he buried his father and he tried to console his mother as best he could. And then he thought what in the time I got left, I'm just gonna work as hard as I can and, and, and get the hospital in the best shape as I can. So he drove back down to Philadelphia. But anyway, as, as he was leaving New Jersey and he got on the New, New Jersey Turnpike, he happened to see a couple of kids by the side of the road with their thumbs out, hitchhiking. And you know, somebody to talk to, he picks them up. They get in the car and as fate would have it, they had just gotten out of macrobiotic cooking school. And it, macrobiotics is, um, is an ancient tradition, really out of Chinese medicine, kind of distilled through Japanese cuisine, where the idea is lots of brown rice, lots of vegetables, uh, very down on meat and dairy and so forth. And they use these diet changes to help cancer patients and to help with all kinds of other things. And so they're telling him all about this and how excited they are. And he, you know, he's telling them his story, he's got prostate cancer, da, da, da. And they basically told him not to worry, that if he just changes his diet, he'll do better. And Tony found these kids completely annoying because they, <laughs> they didn't understand that he was a doctor and he didn't need a lot of uh, consoling mumbo jumbo about eat some brown rice and your cancer's gonna go away. You know, there's so many ridiculous fads that prey on vulnerable people. However, he drops them off and they kind of pry loose his address. And a couple of days later, a package arrives, 67 cents postage due, and he, he opens it up and it's a book um, all about the macrobiotic diet. And he starts reading through it and eventually decides, okay. What, what do you got to lose? Yeah, what, 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 what have you got to lose? And there were some stories in there of people who had done well, including a physician. And so he thought, all right, I'll, I'll give it a try. So he goes over to the Macrobiotic Center in Philadelphia and he learns how to cook brown rice and he goes home and he blows up his, his pots and pans. He says, ah, I can't, I just can't make this work at all. So he goes over there and every day he picks up food that they make for him. And he would go into the hospital, uh, the, the doctor's dining room and with his chopsticks and his brown rice and the other doctors would look at poor Tony who's grasping at straws and you know, this, you know, you got, don't, don't mock the poor dying man except that Tony didn't die. He felt quite well. And up, up until this point, he had been getting worse and worse and worse. And the, the cancer was breaking his bones apart from the inside. This is what we call a met metastatic cancer. And it's extraordinarily painful. And Tony's pain started to go away bit by bit by bit. And so he thought, all right, he didn't particularly like the food, but he thought, I'm not gonna rock the boat. I'm just gonna do this. And so at the six month point, Tony wasn't dead. In fact, he looked pretty good. And at the one year point, he felt perfectly fine. So he did something that made medical history. He went back down to radiology and they repeated his bone scans. And the cancer was not detectable. And so anyhow, I mean, this was one thing, if it was something in some remote area, somebody who happened not to be such a prominent physician, but it happened to him. And so he thought, I don't know what's going on here, but we have to investigate this. And we have to let people know that maybe there is something to how foods affect us. So he became a star and he wrote this book, Recalled by Life, which you could still buy. And, and very, it's, an, it's a really quick read and really interesting read. And he goes on all the talk shows and he becomes a star. And he, he says, I, I can't just practice medicine anymore. I've got to be an advocate for this. And so he did. And as years went by, I heard about Tony. And I started writing books and doing research and I wanted to find out how he was doing. So I called him up and this was maybe a decade later and he invited me over to his place and he pulled out these scans and one is your worst nightmare and the other is a totally healthy guy. And he looked healthy and, and he was. So anyway, it was quite a remarkable recovery. However, there's another twist to the story. Tony, told me something that really made me nervous. He said, I've decided I'm gonna stop the diet. What? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the diet, I'm, um, or I'm gonna modify it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna loosen it up a, quite a lot. And I said, well, why would you wanna do that? And he said, I, I, have, I wanna know if I'll be okay if I don't quite follow this diet exactly and whatever. So, so he did, he loosened up the diet a fair amount. And very rapidly, he started to get swelling in his hands and his energy started to go, go 
go down. He started to get aches and pains. So he went back on the diet as well as he, as, as, but his, his macrobiotic counselor told him, don't go off this diet. Just, curing cancer once is pretty heroic. Do, curing it twice is something that I don't know that we can do. So one day I called Tony, this is a few weeks after this, maybe a month or so, I, I called him up and his voice was all funny, uh, strange. I said, Tony, what, what's with you? He said, your voice is all slurred. He said, it's the medicine. He was on narcotic painkillers for bone pain. His, his, his cancer had come back. He had uh, painful metastases throughout his body and within about a week he was dead. Yes, so this, for, first of all, we don't know if diet caused his cancer in the first place. We cannot know if the diet was the cure or not, although I have to say it sure seemed like it. And we also cannot know if had he stayed with the diet forever, would he, would he have been fine and kept it in remission? We can't know any of that. However, science has kind of caught up with Tony. And we now know that there are dietary antecedents to prostate cancer, as there are for many hormone-related cancers. They are quite powerful. And we also know in from randomized clinical trials that worked there when he had cancer, that diet changes exactly like what he was doing happened to be the way to get this cancer, to put the brakes on it. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's where we are with, with Tony and his story. And he made this most amazing contribution that inspired many, many people to change their diets. And I'm sure he saved so many lives, but tragically his own desire to know how- Well, why do you think, I, I think he did design. that? I honestly, well, I don't know, and I'm just gonna speculate. He was a smart, he was a smart guy and a, and a really nice guy and a lovely person. But he also, see, I think to tell you the truth, like almost everyone else, food addictions kind of well up. And you kind of think, wouldn't a grilled cheese sandwich taste good right now? Or how about some grilled cheese? I'm guessing it was something like that. It could have been just the intellectual thing. Or also, to, let, let's face it, he was cancer free for a long time. Uh, I mean, he, he was sick. He was going to die. And he didn't die. And uh, many, many years went, went after he started the diet, he was cancer free, and it was a long time. So I think he probably just figured maybe he was bulletproof at that point. But, but I, think what I, I think what happened, I think what actually, what probably happened was that he suppressed the growth of the cancer and the cancers regressed. And uh, there's a process called apoptosis, as you know, where, where cells die, they self-destruct. Right. And so a lot of these cells are probably gone, but it takes one cell left in your sternum or, or in your rib or in your skull or somewhere. And then if you start stimulating that cell, it can grow anew. And I think that's what was, I, I suspect that's what killed him. Well, I mean, if somebody goes through the whole process of like surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and they come out, they have a clean bill of health. They've got, they're cancer free. They've gone through the, the process. If, if they don't change their diet or lifestyle, what are the chances that this cancer is going to come back? The chances are high for common forms of cancer because most treatments are not designed, well, all treatments are not designed to completely eradicate cancer. If you have surgery, it removes the primary. Sometimes you can remo remove, in a rare case, a, an unusual case, you might remove some of the metastases. But chemotherapy and radiation, we hope you get most of it, but there can be cells that are hiding elsewhere in the body and that's where the cancer recurs so you have heard of, of obviously of many people who have had cancer they had treatment and no doctor says you're cancer free guaranteed that's that's it we all or at least no competent doctor says that we we have to say we've done the best we can we think you're in good shape here are the odds but every cancer patient is living in the hope that the cancer will never come back well, there's a body of evidence that links dairy products to prostate cancer. What, what's going on here? Well, research, needless to say, prostate cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer. And so researchers at many research centers have tried to figure out what's going on. So, so they started looking at diet. And, and it, the reason for looking at diet is if you look at countries around the globe, those that have more Western diets tend to have more cancer. So at Harvard, researchers began a, a really good study called the Physician's Health Study and they tracked men's diets, and those who consumed the most dairy products had a 34% increased risk 
of developing cancer. So then also at Harvard, the health professionals follow-up study did much the same thing. They tracked men's diets. They looked at who developed cancer, who didn't. Those who are the biggest dairy consumers had now about 60% higher risk of can yes, of cancer. Oh my God, and, and 60%? Right, from, just, from, just from dairy. Now there are other aspects of the diet that can also adjust this even further. Researchers have looked into this and a couple of years ago, researchers just tried to pull all the data together and it does look like dairy is a contributor to cancer risk. At least we have more than enough evidence for prudent men to not consume dairy products at all, um, whether you have cancer in your family or not. Well, one of the things we consume the dairy for is, is vitamin D because it's fortified. I know that vitamin D is something that right. you can actually make. It's, it's not a vitamin. I mean, right, so, right. but you need sunshine <laughs> and, and you create it in your body. Uh, hello, I'm in New England. Yes. <laughs> this is you know, winter, you know, not a lot of sunshine. What can we do besides, you know, okay, a trip to the equator? And Okay. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Did I ever tell you I threw a snowball on the equator? Now, how did you do that? No, you did not tell me that. How, how did you manage? I climbed Mount Cotopaxi to the permanent snow line ah. in Ecuador. Oh, it's on the equator. So not a well, lot of I'll, air up there. Just well, saying. I'll, I'll bet you got some vitamin D while you were there. I did. Well, you're, anyway. Gene, you're touching, you're touching on what's really important here, which is why do dairy products cause prostate cancer? And, and vitamin D is, is, is one of them. The other one, by the way, is something called IGF-1. And for people who have not heard about this, this is big stuff. This is sort of in the same way that cholesterol can lead to heart disease, IGF-1 can lead to cancer in this way. Insulin-like growth factor number one, IGF-1 is a normal substance in your body, but when there's too much of it, it causes cancer cells to grow. So that if you did a blood test and you looked in a woman's body, if she had more IGF-1, her breast cancer risk is higher. In a man's body, his prostate cancer risk is higher. So researchers at Creighton University in Omaha brought in a group of older people, they fed them three glasses of milk per day, and they found that their IGF-1 levels went up 10%. <laughs> so which happens to be about the difference between IGF-1 levels of men who don't have cancer and men who do. So the researchers at Harvard said, aha, our milk drinking men have more cancer, cancer uh, milk raise, raises IGF-1, that's probably the issue. And in a test tube, you put IGF-1 with cancer cells, they just grow, it's like fertilizer, it makes them grow. So IGF-1 is, is I think that's the big thing. But you, you mentioned vitamin D. Vitamin D is a vitamin, it's well, it's actually a hormone, but sunlight on the skin makes vitamin D and it's there to help your body to absorb calcium. However, vitamin D has another function. It's cancer preventer. It helps stabilize cells. And so men who are low in vitamin D activity are at higher risk of various forms of cancer. At least that's what evidence suggests. So here's where milk comes in. If, if vitamin D's job is to help you absorb calcium, well, milk, milk has a lot of calcium. As far as the vitamin D is concerned, it's too much. So your body says, wait a minute, what's all of this calcium doing? It, your, your body reduces vitamin D activation. And when it does that, your vitamin D is not there to protect you against cancer. Now, I know that's a convoluted explanation, so let me just repeat it just really quickly. Um, vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. Milk has perhaps too much calcium, so your body turns the vitamin D off. And without vitamin D, you don't have a cancer shield. So the answer is you need a certain amount of calcium, but you don't need the calcium that's in, in dairy products. And the researchers at Harvard have written about both of these explanations, and they may both be valid. If I'm putting money down, I'm guessing that the IGF-1 uh, issue might be the bigger one. The vitamin D may play a role, but there are other things. An American diet of dairy and meat lacks a lot of the things that will protect us against cancer. Well, you're drinking milk, cow's milk. It's the lactating fluid of another species. Right. And it's to take a baby cow to grow up to be like 600 pounds in like six months. Uh, that would be a lot of growth. So, yes. I mean, you're, you're fueling it. Yes, no, that, no, that's right. Now, some people, some people get this a little bit wrong. They'll say, are you saying that milk has IGF-1 in it and that causes the growth? Well, there are traces of IGF-1 in milk, but that's not the issue. The issue is when you drink the milk, it stimulates your body or the calf's 
body to make more IGF-1 so the calf can grow really fast. Uh, a cancer cell right. can grow really fast. So if milk is designed to, f- to foster very rapid growth, when you're already grown, overly rapid growth could mean cancer. So what vitamin D do you recommend? The one that you got um, up on the mountaintop. So, 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 sunlight. Sunshine. So, okay, sunshine. I'm in well, New England. Come on, winter. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Well, well, first of all, let's just be clear. Sunshine is the natural source. Human beings did not begin life in New Jersey or Boston or you know Saskatchewan or something like that. Human beings, we as a species, convened in I'm going to say Eastern Africa, and there was a lot of sunshine around. Then we had the bad judgment to leave. And we went to places like Fargo, where I grew up, or Billings, or different places. And there's not so much sun as for, for, for months on end, it's too cold to go outside. So if, you, if you're not getting sunshine on your skin, then your skin cannot make vitamin D, which is the, nat- that's the natural source. If you're not doing that, then you should take a supplement. And you can take a supplement. I would recommend about two, for, or most doctors, I should say, would recommend about 2,000 international units a day. Okay. That'd be pretty typical and appears to be safe. Well, one thing that I heard, but but also get rid of the dairy. I mean, you, you oh. have to you know do not be drinking milk because then you're at cross purposes. Uh, right. Yes. So one thing I heard to help absorb the vitamin D was to eat like a nut or two when you're taking your supplement, because you're providing a little bit of oil because it's a you know fat soluble. Vitamin. Yes. Yes. V- vitamin D is one of the four fat soluble vitamins. However, let me be clear that it doesn't take a lot of fat to escort it into your body. You don't have mm-hmm. to have, you know, a, a bag, 16-ounce 60, 60 bag of nuts. Um, like the natu- one or the, two? Yeah, or a half. I mean, the, the, the natural traces of oils in foods mm-hmm. will escort it into your body perfectly fine. And, and, when, and when you get the pill, the vitamin D pill has a little bit of oil actually in it. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that part of it. Okay. Well, omega-3 fatty acids, which are typically found in fish oils, have been also implicated in prostate cancer. What's going on there? This has been a real headache for, for researchers. First of all, they were hoping that omega-3s would prevent heart disease and prevent Alzheimer's, and frankly, they're not working very well. <clears throat> but along the way, in some of these research studies, men with higher levels of omega-3s had higher rates of cancer, particularly prostate cancer. And at first, it was thought to be a fluke. And, and nobody, to my knowledge, ever figured out why this should be. But right around 2013, 2014, researchers had enough evidence that they were basically saying, we don't know why. We don't know why omega-3 supplements uh, or high, very high omega-3 diet could be from fish, why that would increase the risk of prostate cancer. But it seems like it does. And so that gives us an issue because people are hoping that omega-3s will say prevent Alzheimer's, but if they cause prostate cancer, that's not a great trade. I, I have to say, I don't think we know where we are yet. Uh, the science is, is evolving, but I do have a recommendation, which, which is this. You can get tested and see if you're low in omega-3 or not, because if you're not low, who cares? There's, there's no reason to worry. There are companies for, for example, there's one called Omega Quant, as in quantifying your omega. If you could just go online, you'll see them. And I'm not necessarily recommending this com- company over any other, but it's, you know, you pay them 50 bucks and they send you a little card and you put a drop of blood on it and mail it back. And a few weeks later, they'll tell you your omega-3 blood level. And if you're in the low zone, then you can decide whether you wish to supplement or not. If you're in the higher zone, you can decide, say, not to do it. If you are going to supplement, I would suggest, and and I'm not necessarily pitching this because I believe the prostate cancer thing is real, but if you're gonna supplement, you can get DHA and EPA, and there are sources that are are not marine sources. There are regular vegan sources, which would be the one I would take if I were gonna gonna take one. But at this stage, the safety of it's just not clear. Well, some people choose to supplement, you know, the EPA and DHA, hoping to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Right. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? I understand exactly where they are. And, and whenever, you know, somebody like me, I write books and I give guidelines and so forth. You, we always hate it if there's an area where science has not yet quite come back with an answer. So on this issue, this is, this is one of those. And what 
I think the evidence is fairly strong that supplementing omega-3 could increase the risk of prostate cancer. I, I find it not a fluke. I, th I think the evidence of it is consistent enough. So sorry, guys, I think it's really true. However, I'm, I, I've also been impressed by some of the studies that suggest that if you're quite low in omega-3, that your risk of Alzheimer's might be higher. So unfortunately, that doesn't give people a very satisfactory answer as to what they should do. My, my only suggestion is that people should not start popping these pills without consciousness of the risks. And if they are gonna do it, they may wish to get tested first to see if they actually are low. And then if they're gonna buy a brand, I would buy one of the plant derived, the botanical. So brands. you're even concerned about the plant-based ones? Yes. Yes. Now, now um, yes, um, the, the, the theme that you're kind of hinting at is that plant-based things are t generally healthier. But I'm, I'm guessing that the link with prostate cancer in this case is just this big overdose of omega-3 that is perhaps somehow destabilizing DNA. So stay tuned. I'll be a lot smarter in another five years. But we, ha we have to decide, obviously, what we're going to eat tomorrow. So yeah. with regard to, to prostate cancer, we want to get away from the dairy products, get away from the animal products. And then there are certain plant foods that are protective, and we want to build those in too. Well, tomatoes to the rescue. Yeah. Lycopene. Uh, to, to, yeah, to, tomatoes, that's the famous one. The red color in a tomato is lycopene, L-Y-C-O-P-E-N-E, lycopene. Lycopene is it's a carotenoid. By that, I mean it's, a, it's beta carotene is right. in carrots, that's the orange color, and it's, its cousin is lycopene. That's the red color of tomatoes. It's also in uh, water. You slice open a watermelon, that red color, that's lycopene. Pink, pink grapefruit have it also. They are a cancer preventer uh, based on the, the evidence we have. There was a Harvard study where it's kind of a classic study. They looked at men who consumed 10 or more servings of tomato products per week. Their risk of developing prostate cancer was 35% lower than other men. But the, the funny thing about it, the, the, the great thing about it was, it didn't matter if it was fresh organic tomatoes or pizza sauce or ketchup. It didn't matter. The lycopene did its thing regardless. Now, of course, an organic tomato is better than ketchup, but there you go. <laughs> well, is it cooking the tomatoes better to release more lycopene? Yeah. It does seem so, yes. Raw tomatoes, still fine, for sure. But somehow when they are cooked, I, I'm guessing it's because it disrupts the cellular membranes and allows those little lycopene packets to, 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 to go out. But can, can I just make one, one little pitch? The human retina is an underappreciated part of our body. It can recognize antioxidants at 300 yards. You know, if you walk into a huge grocery store and you see the produce aisle at the other end of the store, you see those, those orange carrots, you see the red tomatoes, you see the purple grapes, and what your, what your retina is built to detect is beta carotene, lycopene, and anthocyanins. And if you went into that grocery store with your cat, your cat is a carnivore, and carnivores are interested in prey. So you're, they don't have the same color vision that you have, and he, your cat is not interested in any of that stuff. Your cat is just looking for motion off in the corner. So the, the reason I say this is we tend to think of these colors as pretty. The brain interprets them as something you should have and, 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 and bring into your life. And because that gives you the antioxidants that protect you. And of course, now we take those same colors and we put them in an M&M's bag. But what nature thought we were going to do was to be guided to the antioxidants we should be eating. So thank your retina for pointing out the antioxidants and build them into your life. Well, if you think about it, how big the electromagnetic spectrum is. I mean, yes. it's huge. And we see with our eyes a very, very narrow wavelength of energy. Right. That's right. it. It happens but, but, to be the colors. Well, it's because those people who could not recognize antioxidants didn't, were, were not drawn to those foods and they died. I, I'm, I'm talking about way, 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 way back when, when there, was, when there was not, when those colors really meant something because they would stand out and you would see these foods and, and you would bring them in. And, and the brain, by the way, the brain always interprets them as positive. You know, if you see, there, there are many things the brain interprets as negative, as repulsive, you know, it sort of smells and looks. But with these, the brain always likes red and it likes orange and it likes purple. And that's the brain's way of saying, ding, 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 go get that stuff and eat it. All right. The power of the human retina. Well, it's true. Absolutely. And smells too. I mean, yes. And it's interesting. Like, 
my son and I used to like literally have knocked down drag outs over the last piece of bacon. I mean, like seriously, <laughs> yes, exactly. in the house, like literally, literally, I mean, and fight each other for it. Now I cannot even stand the smell of it in yeah. any way, shape or form. Well, it's because you know what it's going to do to you. Well, partly, and you know where it came I, from. Well, too, but my senses of smell have really changed. Things that I thought were pleasant smelling to me now are really, I got to share one quick story. I make my own dog food and, you know, now I make it whole food plant-based, but back in the day, I used to add some chicken to it. So I used to cook the chicken outside in a crock pot because I thought it smelled so bad. Well, it was 17 degrees out and I'm like, yeah, the crock pot's not going to cook. So I put it in the garage and my husband went out there. He didn't know I put the crock pot out there. He's like, oh my God, I think the sewage backed up in the garage. <laughs> said, that, no, dear, that's the chicken cooking. That's, that's an endorsement if ever I heard one. Hey, now, now by the way, Gene, you know, dogs can be vegan. They, they do very well this way. And there are vitamin supplements if you're at all concerned. They right. do so well. And I learned this back before I traveled to the extent that I do now. Many, many, many years ago, I had my dear dog, Betsy, and I would open up a can of dog food and you see you know, the artery in there you know it just looks so it, creepy so yeah. i started started looking around and i discovered they do very well on a plant-based diet you want it to be really healthy plant-based foods but they love them and and here in the office i have a little dog here named axel who is my assistant's dog natalie said the dog and axel goes crazy for broccoli and brussels sprouts and when you look at the dogs who eat plant-based diets they just they tend to actually do very, very, very well. And they love garlic, they love Italian food. I, I, they may actually be Italian, I'm not sure. They, the, the dogs will start talking with their hands if you give them enough uh, vegan food. So for all the listeners out there, you might okay. explore ve vegan foods for your dog. You, it doesn't work for cats. Cats need taurine as a supplement or otherwise their eyes go bad. You can do it, but they need supplementation. Plus okay. cats will hold, they'll hold their breath till they turn blue. They don't want, they don't want to go vegan. Okay. What are some of the advantages of soy products? Soy products are interesting. It, it, obviously, the story starts with looking at Asian countries where soy is a tradition. And soy products have been associated with protection from prostate cancer, just like tomatoes have as well. And so researchers have looked into this. And a, a fairly large study just a couple of years ago looked at those men who had the most soy products had about a 29% reduced risk of developing prostate cancer. So, okay, we do the math. I'm going to have tomatoes in my routine and soy in my routine. We're starting to get some real benefit. Uh, however, there's a funny twist to this study that some of the soy products were unfermented, like um, soy milk uh -huh. um, or tofu, and some were fermented, like miso, for example, or uh, tempeh. And so the fermented ones are the ones that people talk about a little bit more. It turned out that they all worked. In fact, the unfermented ones that you could just, you know, glass of soy milk, they were actually slightly more protective than the others. So I think they could, can all be part of your routine. They don't increase cancer risk. They clearly reduce it. And you and I were speaking in a previous program about uh, soy and for women. It reduces the risk of developing breast cancer uh, by about 30%. And so men, surprisingly enough, get almost the same quantity of benefit in this case for their prostate. Well, I got to yep. put a plug in for soy yogurt. So easy to make. Have you made it yet in the, in the Instant Pot? I have not made it, but I, you told me how to do it. And I thought it sounded so cool and easy. I, was, I think it's impressive. It is. And it, seriously, so easy. Soy milk, one eight ounces to one capsule of a probiotic, like acidophilus. Put it into, mix it up and put it into a glass jar. Put it in the Instant Pot. Press the yogurt button. It's pretty simple. Cool. And it comes out pretty amazing. And I'm using this, I'm really starting to experiment with this a lot now and adding like coconut extract to the yogurt and it gives it such a nice flavor. Mm -mm -mm. Well, let me make another, another one more pitch for soy products. And again, they're totally optional. You don't have to have them, but they have benefits not only for reducing the likelihood of developing cancer, but there's some evidence that they can also help men who have been diagnosed already. There's a, a, a registry in the state of California for just people with cancer and how they do. And researchers looked at Japanese American men compared to everybody else in California who is not Japanese American. 
And what they discovered was that if they got cancer, the Japanese American men were substantially less likely to die, about 34% less likely than other Americans to die of their cancer. And so the researchers looked into it, and again, as, as you can guess, it's the same hypothesis, that these are people who know what tofu is. And so they are much less likely to develop cancer if they get cancer, they are less likely to, likely to die of it, and it is an exact parallel with women and breast cancer. Japanese women were less likely to get it. If they got it, they were less likely to die of it. And then when westernization occurred, that benefit was lost. Oh my gosh. Uh, I think Anthony's story illustrates how food can influence not just whether cancer starts, but whether it advances or regresses. Would you share some research with us about this? Dean Ornish, I think, really gets the credit here because researchers have looked at cancer survival in many ways, but he is the one who said, okay, let's do a randomized clinical trial, the best kind of science that we do. And what he did is he brought a large group of men into his study. They all, had, they all already had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And as you know, sometimes prostate cancer advances rather slowly, and so you don't have to have surgery or radiation, you can wait. And that's what the, these men were. They had slowly advancing cancer, um, so they didn't necessarily have to have treatment right now. And what you do is you track a blood test called PSA, or prostate-specific antigen. And as long as the PSA level is not rising too quickly, you just leave it alone. You say, okay, that cancer is going to progress so slowly, it's not going to kill you. So Dr. Ornish, who I think is a genius, years ago he revolutionized the treatment of heart disease, and he's looked at many other things. But now in his sights came prostate cancer. So he brought in a group of men, half of them were asked to keep on their normal diet, the other half were put on a vegan diet, no, no animal products, plant-based diet. And uh, the PSA levels were tracked. In the control group that was not making any changes, exactly what you think would happen, happened. Their PSA levels kept inching up over about a year, about a 6% rise. Not much, but it's not good. And in the people on the vegan diet, that didn't happen. Their PSAs did not rise, as a, as a matter of fact, on average, they fell about 4%. So that's looking good. And a few people in the control group could not continue. They had to drop out of the study because their cancer was advancing. They had to have treatment. That didn't happen at all in the first year in the, the vegan group. Now, as the years go by, you're going to see people in both groups having some trouble. But it, looked, it looks like the low-fat plant-based diet is a significant break on the cancer process. You just take your foot and says, I do not want to die of this disease, and it just slows it down. Now, some people are going to not do well no matter what, what their dietary change is, but in the case of, of Tony, whom we started out with, Tony had an advanced cancer. What does he do? He gets all the animal products out of his diet. He'd never heard of Dr. Ornish. This work hadn't been done then. The break went on his cancer, and then at some point, he lifts his foot off the break. The cancer progresses and kills him. So... While we do need more research, I would strongly encourage any man who's got cancer to begin a low-fat plant-based diet, but I would also encourage that man to talk to his sons and his grandkids and everybody else and say, why don't we eat now the kinds of foods that might make it less likely to get cancer at all? And I think that's the most prudent thing to do. We keep coming back to the food. It's the food. Yes. No, truly. Okay, changing tracks. Testicular cancer. W what is that? Uh, testicular cancer, actually, it, it is what you think it is, that there's a cell in a man's testicle that has gone crazy and has started to multiply. And the, the bad news is it's, it's common. It's the most common cancer in young men. Men up to about age 45, this is number one. Number, the good thing about it is he's going to find it because he's, he's in the shower, he's bathing, and he feels this lump, and, and he, gets, he goes and has that testicle removed, is what's going to happen. However, researchers started to, to wonder, what the heck is this about? Because we're seeing more, more uh, testicular cancer. And there, the short answer is we do not know, but the, the, the longer answer is we have a couple of leads. The first one is, is intriguing. Men when they were a, 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 a developing baby in their mother's womb, 
if they were exposed to more estrogens in utero, mom is taking them as a medication or whatever, the risk of, of uh, testicular cancer was higher, number one. Number two, cheese. You've heard me talk about cheese, and cheese has estrogens in it. And studies have shown, there's a good 2003 study that was particularly eye-opening, that men who consumed the most cheese had a lot more cancer, 87% more higher risk of testicular cancer compared to other men. Now, it's still, well, I was going to say it's not super common, but, but an 87% increased risk is not something that you, that you want. So... Um, the, the, That's huge. It, well, it is huge. But, but the, the, the good thing is that all the steps we talked about for prostate cancer prevention, avoid dairy, avoid animal products, have plant products in your diet, it, you, could, you would take exactly that same prescription and it would also be what you do for testicular cancer. So the, the good news is you don't have to have one diet for this and another diet for that. In general, our bodies respond very well to a plant-based diet. Well, it's becoming the most common thing, you know, the testicular cancer for men. Right. Is it could be genes? I mean, is it genes or is it just the environment or a combination um, of both? Well, most cancers are a combination. In other words, the, first of all, the gene, the man's Y chromosome, you know, gave him testicles. If he didn't have that, that wouldn't have been a problem. However, there, there can be vulnerabilities to cancer. There are certain genes that make it harder to excrete carcinogens, for example, which of these could, could play a role for testicular cancer, we don't know. But the part you can control is your environment, and the plate is the part of the environment that matters the most. So I would strongly avoid, I, I would encourage everybody to avoid dairy. Breastfeeding from mom is a good idea. A good long breastfeeding period is important. After that, the weaning process is what protects you from the, all the untoward things that that milk can, can, can cause after long-term exposure. So what does a guy got to do to tackle his risk of cancer? Well, there's lots of things. First of all, many forms of cancer are more common if we're gaining unwanted weight. Part of that is because extra weight disables certain defenses, but another part of that is that the diet that causes us to gain weight is also the, the diet that stimulates cancer growth, cheesy, meaty diet. So avoid animal products. That means meat. Avoid, avoid dairy products uh, as well. I would suggest really minimizing oils. They are clearly better than butter, but it's good to not have lots and lots of fried foods. Don't forget your protective foods. We talked about tomatoes, lycopene, um, uh, soy products. I would inclu include them in your routine, partly because a soy-based burger is not a meat burger. Soy milk is not cow's milk, so that's, that's a benefit. But also, there, there may well be an actual benefit from soy. With regard to particular nutrients, make sure that you're getting fiber. And when I say fiber, I mean, I mean beans and vegetables and fruits and, and whole grains in their relatively un, unrefined state. And you want to have a generous amount. You, you don't need to count. But if you did count, you'd probably end up at about 40 grams of fiber a day, which is about three times more than your average American is getting now. And don't forget your vitamin B12. You need, on a plant-based diet, you need to supplement B12. And frankly, that's good advice for everybody. But go to the store, go to the drugstore, get the smallest B12 that they have, and I would uh, take that every day. Well, there's two types. There's methylcobalamin and there's cyanocobalamin. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on either one of those? I, uh, yes, I don't know the answer to that, except that both are shown to be effective. And the argument for methylcobalamin is that it doesn't have the cyanide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, so, so you know, <laughs> come on, cyanide? I mean. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't sound very attractive. C cyanocobalamin is an active form of B12. It does work. Whether, it, whether that incy weensy trace of, of <laughs> cyanide has, has a negative effect. But however, you, you'll, you'll be happy to know that when you're online ordering your B12, you will see no shortage of methylcobalamin, okay. which, you, which you can order, which does not have the, the cyanide part in it. Nonetheless, right. th however, the thing not to do is to just skip your B12, because if you skip it, you're going to be fine for many months, and then eventually you're going to get nerve symptoms, prob probably, or you could become anemic. And by the way, this is not true of just, not only true of vegans. Most of the people in the hematology clinic who are low on B12 are not people on a vegan diet. They're people who are on medication or they're over 50. 
they're, they're not able to absorb B12 very well from food. They absorb it really well from the supplements. This, this, this supplemental B12 is, is quite highly absorbable. Nice. Yeah, okay. it is. Yep. Well, I like the title of this chapter, Curing Erectile Dysfunction and Saving Your Life. Okay, I, I get one, but is that going to save? I mean, curing erectile dysfunction, that's going to save my life? Uh, let me Not tell my you. life, but males. Yes. <laughs> let me tell you a story. A man goes into the doctor's office and he says, Doctor, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having some trouble, uh, having some trouble uh, raising the flag if you catch my, my drift. And, right. You know, so sooner or later, the doctor understands that the guy wants a Viagra prescription. So the doctor writes the prescription and says, have a good time, buddy. You know, this will work. It's safe. And the, the patient leaves. That's probably the biggest mistake that doctor has made in his career. Why? It's not that the Viagra is gonna hurt him, but the doctor realizes his mistake. He drops his pen, he runs out the door and he grabs the guy who is just leaving the waiting room. He says, come back in, I, I need to talk to you. Sit the patient down and, you, and the doctor then explains to him, the reason that you have erectile dysfunction is you're, you're not nervous, it's not performance anxiety. And you're not drunk, and it's it's not that's not what's causing your erectile dysfunction. The reason that you have erectile dysfunction, and this is true for the for most most middle-aged men who've got erectile dysfunction, the reason you have it is that you don't have normal blood flow. You have artery blockages. They're the the arteries to a man's private parts are very small, and if he has artery disease, meaning he's got atherosclerosis, plaques forming in his blood vessels that pinches off the blood supply to his private parts to a very substantial degree. And so the, 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 uh, to have an erection is, it's a hydraulic phenomenon that requires appropriate blood supply for it to work. And if he doesn't get any blood flow, it doesn't happen. Mm. So now here's where he's got the man's attention. He says, you have artery disease, not just down there, but in the arteries to your brain the carotid arteries probably, in the arteries to your heart, the coronary arteries, in the arteries to your kidneys. And you are, you are at high risk for having a stroke or a heart attack within the next few years. So you can take this Viagra if you want to, but you must do something else, and that's you must change your diet, get, a, get a regular exercise, you must quit smoking, and the diet change, of course, is to get the cholesterol and the animal fat out of your diet. And then that point, the doctor writes in the chart, I advise the patient on his cardiovascular risk, which is high, and, and the erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine. You remember that the coal miners would put in a, have a canary, and if the canary died, that means that there is something that could kill them too. You get um, out. You get out. You, 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 you get out. Um, now, I, frankly, I think there's a nicer way to do this than killing canaries. However, erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine. It means that guy is sick. And he's, he is quite likely to have a heart attack or have a stroke. And so, so doctors must have this discussion. Well, what could possibly go wrong by taking Viagra and pumping it into your system to allow you to have an erection? What could possibly go wrong? Well, I need, needless to say, you know, in, in these commercials, um, when they're talking about how wonderful it is, and you see the guy in the bathtub and all these, right. you know, with his whatever, they do say, talk to your doctor. Are you healthy enough for sexual activity and so forth? Yes. All, Viagra was actually originally discovered. And it was under, it was being tested as a, as a, a heart medication. It expands the arteries, it lowers blood pressure and, and so forth. It's a temporary effect. It wasn't the world's greatest, but the research volunteers noticed this predictable side effect was that it would enhance their sexual functioning on a very temporary basis. And so that's where the billions of dollars of profit all came from. But, but anyway, the, the, the point here is that we need to address the, the cause of the, of the problem, which is artery disease. Right, well at least, and for men, at least you have that kind of signal, that canary in the coal mine, that yeah. warning. For women, you know, we just kind of drop dead. Uh, not only that, but in women, often the signs are not are are, are even less clear. Right. You're you're right. The erectile dysfunction says, you know, you you you're not getting blood flow, so right. be worried. But even then, when when men have a heart attack, very often this the symptoms, or or more often than in women, the symptoms are I got chest pain. With a woman, it could be you know my my back was sore or I felt fatigued. The 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 symptoms are often quite vague. 
and that's not a good thing. So what, what, it all, what, what we're coming to is that we need to do what we can to prevent this. So risk, so risk factors for heart disease, like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, smoking, these are identical to the risk factors for erectile dysfunction. So what is this telling us? It's the same disease. When your arteries go bad, everywhere that artery was going, whether it was to your brain, your heart, or your private parts, yeah. same problem. Well, what, I mean, we've talked about atherosclerosis. What is it? Atherosclerosis means that particles of cholesterol that are flowing through the blood vessels will start to irritate the artery wall. And when that happens, white blood cells will try to grab a hold of them and sequester them, and you end up getting this sort of growing mass in the artery wall. It's a blob we call a plaque, an atherosclerotic plaque. And it looks kind of like a blister, so to speak. And just like a blister, it can break open. And when it does, it will trigger the formation of a blood clot that is just like a cork in that artery. So day after day, these, these blisters form. And, and by the way, they start in childhood. They don't start when you're 55. Uh, they start in childhood and they get gradually worse and worse and worse. And then at some point, one of them is going to, for many people, is going to break open and lead to a fatal event. Well, back pain is one of the first places where atherosclerosis begins. Why is this? Yes, this, this was an amazing thing, I have to say, and I wrote about this extensively in Your Body and Balance because it, it's, it's something nobody would have predicted. It started off with smokers. Smokers have more back pain. And so researchers thought, well, what's that about? Cigarettes aren't heavy. What's the story? Well, cigarettes have more atherosclerosis. It's more aggressive. So in, in autopsy studies, researchers found that I mean, people who had back pain, very often they had atherosclerosis in a specific place. Um, the aorta comes off your heart and it goes down along the spine, right in front of the spine, and it gives off the lumbar arteries to each vertebral segment. And in the lumbar aorta, the, the aorta passing through the lower back, that it turns out, turned out to be the first place where the artery blockages were occurring. And by age 20 or so, some people would have lost one entire lumbar artery due to this paving over of atherosclerosis. So to be clear, uh, the, the man is eating, or man or woman as the case may be, is eating cheese and meat, they're getting too many cholesterol particles, they're smoking, and they start to get aggressive atherosclerosis, especially in that lumbar aorta. And so they start losing blood supply to parts, more and more parts of their lower back. <clears throat> and the, the lower back is then not protected. So your vertebrae stack up one on top of the other, there are discs in between them, and those discs are like little cushions that if they're not getting good blood supply to the vertebrae, the disc, which was getting oxygen by diffusion, it, it just starts getting fragile. It's like a pillow that breaks, and the stuffings come out of the pillow, so to speak, that the, the, the nucleus comes out of the disc, and it can then press on a nerve, and your back hurts. It started with your bacon cheeseburger mm. um, in, in many cases. Now, who would imagine that diet could affect your lower back? But the science is pointing very much in that direction. Wow. Yeah, that, isn't that amazing? That, that is. When I read that, I was like, oh, my gosh. Well, it explains a lot. You, yes. You know? Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Now, now there's, there's more to it, of course, because the same foods that, that cause arteries to get blocked will also cause weight gain. And a person who's gaining extra weight is straining their back. So it all works um, in kind of the same, same yeah. direction. Well, testosterone, that male yeah. hormone. Some yeah. men attribute their inability to raise their flag as a result of low testosterone and you know, start taking testosterone supplements. So is, is this what's happening? No, I don't think so, actually. I'm just you're, you're right. A, a new disease was invented, a low T. Um, whoever came up with that has probably made zillions of dollars. Yeah. Between, I believe it's 2000 and 2011, testosterone prescriptions increased 400%. What do they do? Not a lot. The guy goes to the doctor and he says, I just don't feel like a man anymore. I don't feel, you know, I don't have my, my libido. I don't have much energy. Uh, the effect on energy is pretty much, is very little. The effect on libido is very, very little. Men can be, their testosterone level can be tested. They're often low. You write the prescription and sort of nothing happens. Now, the question really is, does it matter? Is the testosterone going to hurt him? 
And I don't really know the answer to that. I would have said it's probably going to increase the risk of prostate cancer and increase the risk of cancer progression. I don't think we really know that that's the case. So I think we need to stay tuned. But, but my point is that, that low T is, is sort of this catch-all scapegoat. It's kind of like iron poor blood of the 1950s. Oh, uh, you know, you're, you're, oh you're, you're, you're feel, you remember this, you're, you're, you're feeling under the weather, you're kind of tired, you must have iron poor blood, drink Geritol, <laughs> you remember that, and so people would drink it, and, but they still were fatigued, and they, they were fatigued because they had, you know, kids, and they weren't sleeping, or they were under stress, you know, the Geritol didn't cure any of that, but the, but the iron poor blood was the issue, yeah. so, so the guy's got all kinds of problems, he might be drinking, he might have this problem, that problem, and so if you just take some testosterone, you'll be okay, and it's, it means, it, you know, it's money for the manufacturers, but it's, it's, um, it's not going to be a particularly valuable. Okay. So we've talked about how our arteries are getting clogged. So yes. how are we going to get these narrowed arteries open? How do we okay. do that? Okay. All right. Well, let's come back to Dr. Dean Ornish. Then we talked about him earlier. And before he did the prostate work, he was, he was looking at reopening arteries. And his classic study that made everybody sit up and take notice was published in The Lancet in 1990. He brought in people who had narrowed arteries. And the reason we know that is they, they were hospital patients who had had angiograms that showed their arteries were narrowed. He invites them into a research study. Half of them continued their normal diet and lifestyle. The other half began four things. Vegetarian diet, nearly vegan diet. Uh, no smoking, half hour walk every day, and try to manage stress with yoga or stretching or whatever it was. That was it. No medications, no surgery, not even, not even cholesterol-lowering drugs. And after a year, everybody had another angiogram. And the people in the control group didn't do so hot, but the people who did the vegetarian diet and so forth, their arteries were opening up again so much that you could see a measurable difference in 82% of the men. And I, I, I never told you this, Gene. But I, when I, I got a hold of Dr. Ornish back when this study was going on, and he invited me to come meet the men who, uh, who, who were in, the, in the, the study. And they described this almost miraculous experience. Many of them had angina and chest pain. And so they just kind of like lived with it and would take nitroglycerin. And they, almost all of them said, within four to six weeks, it was just flat out gone. And so, so what that means is by four to six weeks, the arteries aren't really open very much. It's just a tiny change. But you may remember from physics that the, in, the increased, this will be on the test, the increased flow through a vessel is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. That's fancy talk, meaning a tiny, tiny little opening allows that blood to get through and it brings the oxygen to the heart muscle. And so the men feel better. And so we had exactly the same experience then in our research studies in men with diabetes. They come in, they do a vegan diet, their diabetes improves and so forth. And then some of these men say, I had this really unexpected side effect, which is their erectile dysfunction goes away. And we've, we've seen that over and over and over again. And of course, that's not the point of the study, but that's what we've seen. Yeah, but the men are real happy. Well, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how their wives feel about it, but, but yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, it's, um, apart from the fact that they can have sex again, I have to say there's a psychological aspect of it, which is they felt that they were old. They felt, right. they, were, they felt they were dying. They felt they were losing one thing after another. And just the, 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 the resumption of sexual activity for these men means, you know, I'm not dead yet. You know, that they've still got energy. And that, I think, is in some ways the most important part of it. Well, I, all I can say is my husband, okay, when we went plant-based, mm -hmm, and I, I have to tell you, his flag... Yes, sir. Raises <laughs> all the time now. Just right. saying. I mean, I've created a plant-based monster. I mean, no question about it. And exactly. he's trying to make up for the last 15 years that, you know, his flag wasn't raising. And so he's trying to make up. So Well, you, you, know, you, know, you know who this really affects is when the, the word is now getting out and you hear among adolescent males, they hear about this. And so it's, it's funny. And oh, the, world, the, the movie Game Changers talked about this too, <gasps> that when, 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 you, when, you, uh, when you approach young guys with one meal is going to impair your sexual prowess, and that's the cheeseburger. They, and, and of course, in young guys, their idea is you got to eat meat and so forth. Right. That's, that, right. that is a recipe for, for impotence, either over the short run or, the, or the, the long term. So it's now looking like if you want to 
uh, perform like a bull yachty, like one. And that does, that doesn't mean eat the bull. That means eat the, eat the you know, that bull is a vegan. So right. There's a well, I, got to, I got to share one with you. We went to go see the Game Changers, my husband, my girlfriend, and her daughter, okay? And we get out of the movies, and all the women go to the bathroom, because we do that. You know, we, it's a herd mentality. I understand. Headed in. So I said to the girls, we're in the bathroom, you know, washing our hands at the sink. I said, I, I, I'm going to time how long it takes my husband to start talking <laughs> about that scene. I'm going to time it. I'm, I'll text right. you as soon as we get in the car. I'll text you in the moment that that happened. We didn't even get out of the bathroom. <laughs> the three of us, we come out. My husband is standing literally like right outside the door. And as soon as we cleared the door, he's like, oh, my God, did you see that that scene? Oh, my God. And the three of us, we just lost it. We just lost it. I mean, he didn't even <laughs> get outside of the, the theater. He was already talking about that. Oh, let me tell you, Gene, Freud, Freud would have something to say about that. They're, 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 castration anxiety is a real thing. So if, if a guy is losing his function, he can't think about anything else. So anyway. Let um, me tell you. The, the makers of the, James Wilkes, who made Game Changers, I think he made a wonderful, a wonderful film. And I'm, I'm, I think it will motivate a whole new demographic, which is the... Uh, the young male population well, that, unfor that unfortunately right. seems to think that they can eat like they're immortal. And by the time they get into the thirties and forties and fifties, they're paying a pretty big price. And I see this, my husband works in a company that he's primarily the oldest person there by far. Most of the people in the right. company are in their young, you know, their early thirties. Okay. And he works for wall street day traders. And so he sees his, his coworkers, will go out to typically, you know, eat fast food during the day and they come back in and they eat it and they sit down and they're like, well, you know, like an hour later, oh, I don't feel so good. <laughs> exactly. I don't feel... And Their one of them, drained. oh, well, that too. But the other, one of them had such bad, he had pain in his stomach and it was his appendix. And the do doctor was like, okay, we can do this. We can do this. Well, turned out he had to go in for emergency surgery and it was starting to go gangrene inside yeah. his appendix gangrene um by the way i know we've been talking a long time but can i give you a quick quick appendix issue yeah um, this, is for, this is for extra credit something that people could share if they want to the append appendicitis is diet related to a great degree and if you never heard that i'm going to credit dr dennis burkett who discovered the value of fiber in the diet he started to understand why is it that you don't see people needing their appendixes out in countries where they eat really, really high fiber diets. Here's the reason. The appendix is shaped like your little finger and it kind of dangles down below the intestine. And it's wide open and so if people are on low fiber diets, that means a meaty diet, their stools turn into kind of hard little rocks and, and hard to pass. So a little bit of stool can go in there and plug it like a cork. And at that point, the bacteria that are in there start to grow and start to fester and it starts to hurt. And then if you don't deal with it pretty soon, gangrene, yes. You know, it can rupture, it can, it can kill you. Oh. Um, and now, however, you say, well, forget that, I'm gonna go vegan, or I'm gonna have a plant-based diet. Everything you're eating is vegetables and fruits and beans and grains and all the wonderful foods that they turn into, very high in fiber. So the stool never turns into those corks. It's, it's softer, and to use a, an analogy, it's more like pudding, and so it's not going to soft serve, it. like soft serve ice cream <laughs> or something. So it doesn't plug anything up. So anyway, Dennis Burkett would always argue. He would say, you know, surgeon. He was a surgeon. He'd say oh, we wouldn't have to be taking out gallbladders and appendices, and and we wouldn't have to be operating for, for colon cancer anywhere near as much if people would would have a high fiber diet, meaning a, meaning a, a plant based diet. So yes, believe it or not, so many conditions are diet related and appendix. Appendicitis, surprisingly enough, is one of them. Wow. Yep, that's true. Well, he this his his co coworker for about three weeks watched his diet back to his old habits. So, yep. Yeah. What can yeah. you say? It's the food. It's the pleasure trap. It's the seduction of food. Yeah. Well, there's an epilogue to erectile dysfunction. Viagra researchers made a great discovery. Oh Can yes, you share um, with that with us. I put I put this I put this at the very end of the erectile dysfunction <laughs> chapter of your body in balance, and that that was this. If you take Viagra with a really fatty meal, it doesn't work very well. Uh, two two things happen. It the the 
onset of action is delayed by about an hour. And the amount that ever gets into your blood is less. It might be about 29% less. So it just doesn't work as well. So what, so what they're, what they're re recommending is if you're having a romantic dinner and you're slipping your Viagra, make sure that it's a really low fat meal, like a, a vegan meal or something like that. But then of course you think if you ate a vegan meal all the time, you wouldn't need the Viagra in the first place. Right. So there well, you have it. That is an epilogue to erectile dysfunction. That's for yeah. sure. Well, in the next video, we're going to dive deep into diabetes, which I know that's one of your, your big ones. So I look forward to having that conversation. Well, thank you. And, and I hope that, well, first of all, I, I want to say again, thank you for spreading the word as you do. You, you are a wonderful interviewer and your science background is something I'm well aware of. And yet at the same time, you're able to make things really simple. And I appreciate the way you translate things. And I also appreciate the fact that you're speaking to people who may not realize they even need these issues. So if people would pick up a copy of your body in balance before you read it yourself, I'm hoping that people will share it with their husband or share it with their yeah. kids. And do, here's my trick. I always take a book. Here's my book. You can't just hand this to somebody. You've got to take a post-it note and you put it on page 130 or something like that. And you give it to your spouse and you say, sweetheart, I thought about you when I was reading page 130. So that book is going to be opened up within five minutes and he's going to read it. And he's going to read it over and over and over again to try to figure out what you had in mind. If you don't put the post-it note in, you know how a book will just kind of like sit there gathering dust. That's my right. post-it note trick. You do that for people you love. It makes them want to learn what you know yourself. So I'm, anyway, I'm hoping that people will take your advice, find out this information and share it with other people. Well, all I can say is this book is so powerful and I hope everybody gets a copy of this because this is something you need in your home. I mean, truly, it, it's one of your best. I, I do. I think it is. Well, well, thank you. I, I think it's because it's, it's a totally new area of issues. And my gratitude really goes also to these researchers and their research participants, some of whom have come through here. They've given a lot of time and attention to unraveling how the body works. And so now we can put what they found to work. Well, thank you once again. You're amazing. All right. Thank you, Jean.